Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are at this moment and wherever you are in your life's journey, you are welcome to this place of memory and hope where we share our joys and our struggles in our quest for what is good and true. Welcome to this online video worship service for August 1st, 2021. I'm Patrick Webb, worship associate. Our minister, the Reverend John Cullinan, is on sabbatical, and I am delighted to introduce our guest speaker, Reverend Bill Neely. As Unitarian Universalists, we affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person and the interdependence of all life. We come together to learn from each other and we draw inspiration from many sources to work together to build communities of greater justice and compassion. I'd like to extend a special welcome to anyone who is joining us for the first time. Please sign our virtual guest book. If you would like to learn more about the church, you can contact the church office for more information. Whether you are visiting us for the first time or have been part of this congregation for years, May this time we set apart from our everyday concerns help us see what is most important to us in ourselves, in each other, and in the world around us.
our call to worship, with hands of service and hearts of care, and with our being centered in the beauty of creation. Let us raise gratitude for this time of worship, the embrace of the holy, and the community made ever more beloved by our deepest commitment to love. Come one and all, let us worship this hour, that love that brings forth the best within us, that forgives our smaller moments, and that draws us to one another in peace and joy. We hold a chalice to symbolize the oneness of our faith. And we set in the flame to symbolize the universal warmth of love. And to know that the two, when freely joined, bear and bring unity to mind and heart and neighbor and stranger and friend and foe. May we be one in such a holy and enduring flame. We speak our affirmation each week to remind us of why we come together and of the promises we make to each other and to the wider world. In that awareness, I invite you to join in our affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve life in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony. Thus do we covenant with each and with all. On August 9th, the youngest granddaughter of Anne Payne Reeves, Lillian Baker, 13, will have her fifth open heart surgery. The Reeves will travel to Oklahoma to be nearby. Christine O'Brien's partner, Laura, fell and broke her jaw and had surgery on Tuesday of this past week. Please keep her in, her in your prayers for a smooth recovery. For all our joys, for all our sorrows, whether we share them with one another or we hold them close to our hearts, let us be with one another in spirit and in a moment of silence. and for our prayer. Blessed is the night from which dawn springs, the blessed night of darkness and dreams, the peace that lives in moonlight and star-kissed skies of wonder. And blessed is the dawn from which this day flows, the blessed dawn of dew and birds, the rising up to a new and ancient life, a gift of grace for each life everywhere. And blessed is the day from which twilight glows, 
the blessed day of friend and stranger, the art of living, of resilience and forgiveness, of life lived with song and work and one another. And blessed is the twilight from which night is born, the blessed twilight of nourishment and wonder, the slowing down, the settling in, the clarity that lives in the deepening breath that leads us back to the blessed night. Thanks be, Holy One, for these blessings of night and dawn and day and twilight and all that springs forth from them in this creation, not of our making, in these lives of our living and praising. Remind us, Holy One, to live and praise each day, that we might know our lives as so much more than our own, that we might live, breathe, work, and rest, aware of all the sacred hours and all the sacred days. And now it's time for our story for all ages. I'm so happy to share with you one of my favorite stories. It's this book. It's titled Neither or Neither. It's written by an author named Airlie Anderson. And she has said that you can call it Neither or Neither. Both titles are fine. And it might make a little more sense after we hear the story. So I'm going to dig right in here. This is the first page. Once upon a time, there were two kinds. This, a blue bunny, and that. A yellow bird. These, a whole bunch of blue bunnies. And those, a whole bunch of yellow birds. One or the other. Until. Wonder what happens anytime you hear until something's about to happen. Honk! Look at that. That's part bunny, part bird, and a whole different color. And they say, what kind are you? And the bird bunny says, I'm both. And they say, you can't be both. You must be neither. And the bird bunny says, I'm neither? Neither tried to play this game. Or tried to play of this game. You can't play with us. You're not rabbit enough. So the rabbits wouldn't let them play. And then neither tried to play a that game. But they said, you can't play with us. You're not birdie enough. I would feel pretty bad right now if I were neither. Why don't you go find somewhere else? You're not one of us. 
You're neither. 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 And you can see neither's flying away. I would be so sad if I were neither right now. Neither's flying over the land. Like an airplane. Up. And then neither lands. And the tree says, where did you come from? Neither says, honk. I'd be surprised if a tree started talking to me. And then neither says, I'm from the land of this or that, but I'm neither. So I'm looking for somewhere else to fit in. And this flying kitty cat here says, this isn't somewhere else, but you will fit in here. Where is here? So many different kinds. And here is the land of all. Kind of hold the book a little closer so you can see all the beings in the land of all. Such pretty artwork. Interesting, creative pictures. And then look at that. They say, come play with us. But I'm different from everyone here. I'm neither red, nor orange, nor yellow, nor blue. I wonder how they'll respond. <gasps> they say, exactly. And look, it's a rainbow. It's a rainbow of people in the land of all, or beings. And then look what happens. Excuse us, we're from the land of this and that, but we don't fit in at home. We are looking for somewhere else. You see, that's a birdie and a bunny, just like the beginning of the story. And I think the reason they don't fit in is because the bunny has a little blue swirl in the tail, and the birdie has some green dots on the wing, and that didn't happen in the land of this or that. You didn't have those. And then neither says, but you said I was neither. You said I should go somewhere else. I wonder how neither will respond. Oh, look at that. Well, this isn't somewhere else. This is a land of all, and everyone fits in here. Show you both pages here. Lots of cool pictures again. I wish I could draw like that. It's really nice. Once upon a time, there were many kinds. This and that. Somewhat and whatnot. Either. Very. Sort of. Just. Rather. A little. Neither. And both. And all were welcome. Like so many pictures again. And that's the story about the land of all where all were welcome. So I love that story for a lot of reasons. One is just because I love that land of all place. That's where I'd want to be, where all are welcome. And I think we try to make our UU congregations lands of all where all are welcome. And when we're at our best, we're always welcoming more and more and more people. But I also like it because it encourages me to remember that whenever I think there's a choice between two, this or that, up or down, left or right, good or bad, there's probably more choices. Very rarely are there only two choices or two kinds or two things, two poles that we have to pick from. The truth is usually in the middle, and the middle is where all the diversity is. There's usually more than just two things. So that's why I like this story. Again, it's called Neither by Early Anderson. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, let's move on with our worship service.
and our reading is a poem titled Being a Person by William Stafford. Be a person here, stand by the river, invoke the owls, invoke winter, then spring. Let any season that wants to come here make its own call. After that sound goes away, wait. A slow bubble rises through the earth and begins to include sky, stars, all space, even the outracing, expanding thought. Come back and hear the little sound again. Suddenly, this dream you are having matches everyone's dream, and the result is the world. If a different call came, there wouldn't be any world, or you, or the river, or the owls calling. How you stand here is important. How you listen for the next things to happen. How you breathe. Once there was a man who wanted to become a woodcutter or a logger. He had never done it before, but it looked exciting. He liked being outdoors and he was of the age where he needed to earn his own living. And he thought that logging would be a good match. 
He went to a place where they were cutting down trees and he asked a supervisor to be hired. He acknowledged that he didn't have much experience, but promised that he was a quick learner and a hard worker, and he was sure that he'd be able to do a good job. The supervisor decided to give him a tryout to see how fast he could work before hiring him for good. And the man responded by borrowing an ax and cutting down a tree very quickly. Impressed, the supervisor gave him a job and the logger went to work right away, cutting down tree after tree. He outpaced everyone else on the site on that first day. That was on a Monday. On Tuesday, he showed up again and worked at the same pace. On Wednesday, the same thing. On Thursday, too. He never slowed down. And yet at the end of the day on Thursday, the supervisor let him know that Thursday was going to be his last day. The logger didn't know why. He had worked steadily and at the same speed, chopping down trees all day, every day since Monday. He had worked so hard. The supervisor replied that he could see that he worked hard, but for some reason, he just wasn't cutting down as many trees as everyone else. Someone had to go, and so the supervisor just went with whoever wasn't making as much progress. The guy didn't understand how that could be the case. He worked constantly. In fact, he told the supervisor he had noticed that each day, many of the others would spend hours or more sitting down, sharpening their axes and taking it easy while he would be busily chopping away. He never took those breaks. The supervisor said, you didn't sharpen your ax before you chopped? The logger replied, no, I just got right to work. Well, that's why you've fallen behind, the supervisor said. You have to sharpen your axe every single day. If you don't, you'll take more swings and make less progress. You can try again, but sharpen your axe every single day. One of the lessons in this old story is that what looks like rest might really be work or preparation for work. Reminds you of the old adage, good rest leads to good work. Or another lesson that preparation is key to success, plan, then do. There are lots of takes from this story, which is one of several versions of various woodcutter parables that float around, usually of unknown or unclaimed origin. They're often lumped in with a quotation attributed to President Lincoln, who once said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening my axe. Maybe that quotation will help if the image of felling trees in today's world is unpalatable. Just imagine President Lincoln saying it and it takes on a different air. I've always loved that sentiment. Give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening my axe though I do indeed fail to heed it from time to time. Sometimes I just rush right at the tree, dull axe in hand, when I would be much wiser to stop for a minute, have a seat, sharpen the axe, and in the process, take a breath, and think about things for a minute. I'm not sure taking a minute has ever been the wrong choice in my life. To be fair, it doesn't always lead to the right choice, but I still don't think that extra minute has ever really hurt. I do know that rushing into things has, that there are times when taking a minute would have been the wise choice to make, when it would have been better to stop, breathe, and be, and prepare for what is to come, rather than going tree to tree without break, working toward diminishing results. I remember a long time ago now, back in seminary, when I studied alongside your wonderful minister, John Cullinan, during one of the end of term rushes, when we were all trying to turn in a bunch of papers at the exact same time, among the classes I was taking was one titled Sexuality and the Black Church, and another class was titled was on the works of the great Protestant theologian Paul Tillich. These are very different subjects, and the two classes were not at all similar, yet final papers were due on each, and I had mixed up the assignments such that the question of the Tillich class was what I began to answer in the final for the sexuality and black church class. I was about halfway through when I realized that I was writing the wrong essay for the wrong class and that I had to start completely over, and that what I had written was useless in either class because I was answering the question for one class by writing about another And I can still remember how that started. I just sat down in the library, looked at the essay topic, and dove right into the writing without taking a minute to make sure that my head was in the right space. At the time, that was stressful. Now, it's no big deal. But it shows how easily we can become overwhelmed and not take a breath and focus and rest for a minute when we really, really need to. And it reminds us of how we can lose time and effort and energy when we fail to rest as required. And it is required. 
Rest is required in the Hebrew scriptures. The God of Moses famously demands a day of rest as one of the Ten Commandments in Exodus, and they are uttered by the voice of God for all the people to hear. To this point, most interpretations of the Exodus story have God speaking just to Moses, who relays the information to the people. But in chapter 20, God speaks directly to the people and God gives them rules that are formulated differently in various specific traditions. But keeping the Sabbath holy is in all of them. Generally, the 10 are no idols. Don't take God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Honor your parents, don't kill, don't cheat, don't steal, don't lie, don't covet your neighbor's partner, and don't covet your neighbor's stuff, or in other words, just don't covet. If you're coveting, just stop it. And God says these words, which are followed by lightning and thunder, and the scripture says that the mountain starts smoking and there are all these trumpets in the air. The people are terrified. They had just been griping to Moses about God always speaking to him and not directly to them. And then God speaks to them. And the first thing they say to Moses when God is silent again is, yeah, let's just have God speak to you from now on. And then you can tell us what God says, because if we go through that smoking mountain and trumpet and thunder thing again, we will die. The scripture has them saying that if God speaks to us, we're going to die. The story is one source of the wisdom behind the millennia old advice of rabbis around the world who caution people about praying for God to speak directly to them. If that prayer is answered, you might not like what you hear and you might really not like how you hear it. Or the advice is to be careful when asking for God's personal attention because you might get it and it might be terrifying and it might be better to lay low and just let God do the God things. And from that divine human interaction of comedy and fear on Mount Sinai, we, in the tradition as it has journeyed through millennia to us today, have this commandment to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy, to do no work. Not only us, but our children, people who work for us, our animals, and every stranger in every land. We are not to work ourselves, and we are to require no one else to work either. This absolute commandment is a reflection of the seventh day of creation in which God rested. The seventh day is not a day in which God created nothing. It's a day in which God created rest by observing it. And then God blessed the day in which rest was created. The only day of creation that God blesses is the seventh day, not the sixth when God creates animals and people on the land or the fifth when animals of the sea spring to life or the earlier ones where light and dark and earth and sky and sea are created. The days of work aren't blessed. The day of rest is. Those creations are called good, but the only day that is blessed is the one of rest. And that sense of blessed rest permeates everything about the faith that follows and the traditions that would emerge, including our own work, Work hard, but also rest and be well, for that part is blessed. There is a sense in our world, in the world, ancient and modern, that our value is determined by what we can produce, that our, our worth is something that can be measured economically, that health and strength and favor are made evident by what we possess or manage or control. Productivity is seen as a measure of worth as it was in the story that began the service. This leads to the market becoming an object of worship, becoming that which we serve. And the commands of the market, which often run counter to the commands of Sinai, become that to which we ascribe our lives, even though the commands of the market can never, ever, ever be satisfied. For as one command is met, another more demanding one comes to life, all the way to space and back. And the escalation of work in the market cycles on and on and leaves less and less and eventually no room for that blessed rest or that rest even becomes scorned as something seen to detract from what the market demands we produce. It's a kind of profanity in Moses's time and ours. Similarly, there is a sense in the world, ancient and modern, that our value is determined by how well we serve Pharaoh or Caesar or the state, that citizenship and nationality and devotion to political leaders and rulers and parties are measures of our favor and integrity and wholeness. There is nothing biblical in unquestioned devotion to a political leader, any political leader, and it is completely biblical, literally the stuff of prophets to raise faith-based objections to immoral actions of political leaders. But devotion above the holy to a leader or party or even political ideology is a strong temptation, then and now. 
it's clear and simple and easy to mouth, lends itself to self-righteousness and the mocking of the other and plays to the divisiveness that sells so well because we buy it so much. In ancient times and today, it is easy to confuse who we are as children of creation with how we live in a political world or a market world, or as is really the case, a world in which those two always intersect. In the midst of these ancient and modern confusions, when we think we are products of the market or meant to serve the market, or we think we are products of the state or meant to serve the state, we are reminded through keeping the Sabbath that we are products of the holy and meant to serve the holy. We belong to neither the market nor the state, but to the holy. That's what makes our lives blessed and the day blessed. That's why the Sabbath is to be regularly observed for one day. We serve not the market so that we know that our worth comes not from what we produce, but from who we are. And for one day, we serve not the state so that we can remember that our faith and allegiance must be in something greater than something as small as the power and ambition of the political world. It's in these ways that practicing Sabbath is innately a political and economic act of human freedom and dignity. It's a statement then and now about who we are and who everyone is as children of creation. It is not a statement of dissent from the ways in which we organize our lives and societies, the ways in which we earn livings and build families, the ways in which we care for one another and future generations, but it is a dissent from allowing those tasks, responsibilities, and distractions to be confused for all of who we are. And while a complete day of rest in the ancient sense is probably not workable in many lives, not my own, not many, I'm sure, regular Sabbath periods are possible if practiced with intention, and it does take intention. A few weeks ago, I went to check my phone to find out that it had completely lost all of its power. The battery was at zero, and I think what I did was leave the music on for a long time. I turned it down, but hadn't turned the phone off. I'm not actually sure what happened, but for some reason, it was at zero reminding me that it had been working that whole time. It's a machine. It works until you turn it off or until it runs out of battery power and you have to plug it back in. And it's exactly like us in ancient days and today. We are often going until we're not going. We are working until we, with intention, stop working and recharging, remembering who we are and whose we are and why we're here and what we really want our lives to be about needs and demands the practice of Sabbath on a regular basis. We have to step away from that which demands our attention and commands our obedience to know again that our value is not a marketable political commodity. Our value is in being children of creation. Our value is that day six image of creation springing forth cattle and caterpillar and butterflies and bison and porcupines and people meant to live in harmony with creation and one another. Life is the gift, not what we make, how much we have or what we can buy. The measure of our worth was settled eons ago when stars and cells conspired to bring life forth and bless us with life and with one another. And though life calls us to many things on many days, it calls us again and again to one day that is blessed. And that is the Sabbath, which we keep holy by remembering the holy source of our lives. It doesn't have to be a whole day, and it can happen more than once a week. And the ways in which we keep the Sabbath certainly do not have to mirror ancient ways. But we must practice blessed rest in our own ways with intention. We must resist the urge to run headfirst into the market and the world day after day after day and chop away with a dull axe so much so that life becomes more difficult for us than it needs to be. We can instead look at the work to be done and look at the people preparing and we can join them and sit down and learn from and with them. And when the time to work comes, we can work. And when the time to rest comes, we can rest. And when the time for study comes, we can study. For that is how the ancient ones, for the most part, approach Sabbath as a time to study, a time to remember these ancient stories that they completely knew by heart and consider their wisdom anew, a time to listen for the voice of the holy through ancient hymns and prayers, a time to learn anew the story of creation, the story itself being the miracle, and to find astonishment in our role in it, and to know again how that connects us with every being everywhere of all time. Sabbath is a time to remember that our worth comes from the holy. It has nothing to do with what we own or what owns us or whose power we prefer. 
Sabbath reminds us that our worth was determined eons ago by an unimaginable universe of grace and wonder. We never earned our worth to begin with, thus it will never go away. It's an original blessing bestowed on every life, and Sabbath intends to remind us of that. Praise be for that challenge and that gift, and may Sabbath keep the assurance of worth and grace in our hearts and minds this day and always. May it be so, and amen. Thank you, Reverend Bill, for your thoughtful words. Next week, our guest speaker is Joanna Crawford from the Live Oak Unitarian Universalist Church in Cedar Park, Texas. Please remember that if you plan to watch the service Sunday morning at 1030 at the church, you must reserve a seat. The number of individuals allowed in the building is currently capped at 50. As we continue to gather as a community in the church building to watch our recorded services, four volunteers are needed each week to continue to make this happen. For an explanation of duties, click on the Volunteer at Services tab on the church website. To sign up, to attend, or to volunteer to help, please use the church website or contact the church office. If you are joining us for the first time, we invite you to sign our virtual guest book. And everyone is reminded that you can submit personal joys and sorrows in our virtual prayer book. The Reverend John Cullinan will be on sabbatical until November 1st. During this time, we invite you to direct your questions and comments to the church office. The links for doing all these things are in the service notes below the video. Please continue to check our website and our Facebook page for announcements. If you haven't already done so, sign up for our email announcements for opportunities to connect on Sunday and during the week. Our offering is an opportunity to share some of what we have with the wider world. Our community partner for the month of August is the Los Alamos Family Council. The mission of Los Alamos Family Council is to promote emotional and social well-being through education, prevention, and counseling. 100% of all the offering collected this month will be given to our partner. Please use the link below in the service notes or download the Givelify app and select the Unitarian Church as your gift recipient. May the offertory music lift your spirits and may what you give bring you joy. And for our benediction, 
Go forth grateful for the moments before you, the breath within you, the people among you, and the spirit guiding you toward lives of greater love and kindness. And go forth knowing that you are held always and always with everyone else by that great love of no beginning and never ending. Go in peace and amen.